I'd be just curious, who here has actually read Ulysses? Anybody? Okay. Bounce off it. Huh? Bounce right off it. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, it's not, yeah, it's kind of, um, who's at least heard of Ulysses a little bit? Okay. Um, just trying to get a gauge. Last time I asked who knew Ruby, this time I'm asking who knows Ulysses. Um, okay, so today is June 16th, and June 16th is a special day. And why is this day more special than other days? Well, I mean, obviously it's Maritime DevCon, which is a pretty special day. I've been enjoying it. I'm really looking forward to enjoying at least the last session, because they always enjoy the one after you finish your own, um, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, and I'm also enjoying the after party, so looking forward to seeing all of you there. Uh, I warn you, I'm a little underslept. Uh, as you'll see, I had to have a bunch of stuff go live today, and uh, I was up kind of late getting all the little pieces together, as I'm sure you all are familiar with that feeling, so, and I'm a little raggedy at this point. but. Going along, but it is of course Maritime DevCon, but it is also Bloomsday, and Bloomsday is the day when literature nerds all around the world come together and celebrate the modernist landmark novel Ulysses by James Joyce. And here is my beat up copy that I had from college with all the handwritten notes in it, and here is the much nicer edition that I haven't actually messed up yet. Anyway, <laughs> um, and I was really excited when I discovered that Maritime DevCon was happening on June 16th on Bloomsday this year because it meant that I could come up here to Fredericton all the way from Halifax and I could talk to a room full of developers and computer people about modernist literature. Um, now that's not that weird actually. I've been sort of an amphibious nerd all my life. Um, I've been into tech stuff and I've been into literature types. I'm in many ways what uh, Steve Jobs described as at the crossroads of technology and the liberal arts. Uh, liberal, and this is a more common term in the States, liberal meaning stuff from books, not necessarily left wing, although I kind of am. But um, I've spent almost 25 years as a developer building software professionally, um, but I also have an MA in English literature from the University of Toronto. And um, looking back as I started prepping this, I sort of realized that a lot of my approach to technology has often been sort of through the eyes of literature or art or culture and bigger things like that. Um, but also I realized that my approach to literature has often been pretty tech heavy as well. Uh, when I was studying, I was one of the earlier people in my class to like download whole texts from Project Gutenberg and just do searches. Instead of previously, everyone had to just go through every single page and read, try to find references to things. I could just search for keywords. Um, I managed to avoid writing a whole paper about something about Moby Dick uh, because I just did a five-minute search for Moby Dick and realized that reference wasn't actually there, so I could just skip it. Skip. Anyway, I'm an amphibious nerd, and I know a lot of computer people will often think, "Oh, literature people, you just sit around reading poetry and thinking thoughts about beauty and language." And well, actually, literature people can be super nerdy if you give them the right thing. And there are definitely literature nerds who are nerdy in the same way that technology people are pretty darn nerdy as well. And that kind of obsessive details, kind of like, I'm going to figure out all these obscure references and things like that. And Ulysses um, is exactly the kind of perfect text for the super hardcore literature nerd. Um, there are a few books in the English language that are nerdier than this one. So what is it, what exactly is this book? So first, a little bit of context about the book itself. Um, and sort of where it comes from and what it fits into. Uh, it is one of the landmark texts of the modernism movement. Um, and modernism doesn't mean modernism contemporary right now, it means sort of a cultural movement in the early part of the 20th century. Um, so if you think about the Victorian era was full of very, a lot of, um, a lot of achievements and people were sort of People were encouraging students not to even bother studying physics, for example, because, well, we figured almost all of it out. There's not going to be much more to study. Same thing with mathematics. Culture, a lot of people, you know, um, up, through most, up, up until the late 19th century, uh, there was no real reason to disbelieve that the world was created 6,000 years ago, uh, unless you're some kind of specialist or something, uh, and that God's will was, was obvious and, 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 and really clear on Earth and things like that. Um, but things like uh, Darwin, Freud, uh, the growing science of astronomy, um, uh, the growing evidence of, against things like biblical truth, etc. Um, and then even bigger, the shock and horror of World War I and sort of the end of the colonial period changed all these comfortable perceptions about how the world works and how sort of assumptions are made about things. And modernism reflected a lot of that. So here, for example, is Picasso. This is a Picasso painting from 1896. 
before modernism really kicked in. And this is a Picasso painting in 1921. So this is your brain. This is your brain on modernism, right? Uh, this is supposed to be a guitar player. Um, that's, you know, First Communion. Uh, so this is the kind of thing, that's obviously in visual arts, but the same thing was sort of happening in literature. Um, old narrative forms that were big in the Victorian era, you know, standard things we think about now. Boy meets girl, boy loses girl. Uh, a heroic person struggles against adversity and succeeds. Uh, maybe somebody grows up and discovers their true self. All these kinds of stories, people, you know, once upon a time live happily ever after. These really didn't seem to fit anymore in this world where, you know, um, machine guns were shooting up entire generations uh, and, you know, all sense of meaning was sort of collapsing. Um, and so things became fractured, identity became fractured, what things mean became fractured. The Wasteland, which is a famous poem by T.S. Eliot, came out the same year as Ulysses did, which is quite the year, it was 1921. Uh, and the big line from there is, I shore these fragments against my ruins. People were saying, I need to howl home with something, but they were going to be fragmented, sort of broken up, kind of almost little pieces of meaning trying to hold things together. And it, I'm not going to go into big literary analysis, this isn't the place, but uh, it starts with a bunch of, you know, poetic things, and then it breaks into just sort of, we were on a, a nice day somewhere in Germany and drank coffee, and then there's a bunch of other things. It's, it, it's all sort of mix and matches together, it's not just... Today we went this, and then this, and then this. Uh, Yeats, who's another Irish writer and poet, uh, has his famous poem, um, where things fall apart, the center cannot hold. So things were kind of flying apart. All the old assumptions were kind of breaking down. And into this world comes James Joyce, from 1882 to 1941. He's an Irish writer. He started with plays and poetry and moved on um, eventually to writing short stories and novels. He was super educated, studied with Jesuits, uh, but he had real trouble settling down. Eventually, he married a um, un fairly uneducated woman uh, named Nora Barnacle, and they moved to Paris in 1904, and then Zurich, and managed to escape most of the troubles of World War I and all the Irish revolutionary stuff that was happening, too. Among many other things he was doing, he also opened Ireland's first cinema, which is an interesting factoid I just found out. Um, now, so, okay, I'm talking about a whole bunch of our cultural stuff. This is a development conference. This is a tech conference. Why am I bothering? Um, so, you know, I mentioned even augmented reality in the blurb. So what's up? Where, where is the augmented reality? Well, one of the things about Ulysses that I think I, I find really uh, impressive is that it's actually about reality augmented in a certain way. Um, so Ulysses takes that sort of normal narrative that you think about with normal stories, normal novels, there's a narrator that says, this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this was a good person, this was a bad person, we found that out, and then they live happily ever after, that kind of thing. Um, and it sort of breaks it out into two directions. In the first direction, it's super, super direct. Um, it's very, it's like super, super realistic. Um, it takes place on a very specific time and place with very specific people and specific activities. Um, it takes place in Dublin, Ireland. I know it's called Ulysses, we'll get to that later. Dublin, Ireland on June 16th, 1904. The very specific day, it's actually the day of uh, James Joyce's first date with the woman he would later marry. Um, and he remembered that day, he remembered the weather, he then did a lot of research in the archives to make sure he had all the right tram schedules and everything else like that. But he's very specifically recreated every single nuance of that day. Um, and it shows everything, real places, real people. And it's like a photo. So, you know, if you think about when photo photography came around, you used to be able, you used to make paintings. And if you have a painting of a woman walking down the street, it would mostly be the woman walking down the street. The street and the woman, that's it. Um, a photograph shows you not only the woman walking down the street, but also all the other stuff going on around it. So this, you know, this cranky guy. Uh, you know, you could read all the little advertising notes in the windows, uh, fountain pens repaired, even, you know, medical something or other. There's little newspapers and magazines in the back. A photograph, which, you know, still fairly new technology, and if you remember, Joyce was even, like, into cinema at this point, um, shows you everything, whether you want it or not. And um, the writing in Ulysses is a lot like that. You get not just sort of, someone said went to the pub, but when he was walking to the pub, his eye went across these advertisements, and he started thinking about this song that he knows, and there's this, does he have any meat at home, and all these other things, and then he gets see some girl somewhere and things kind of lewd thoughts and it sort of just rolls along and rolls along in the way that our minds really work without necessarily that kind of like universal idea of here's a truth that I'm expressing. Um, 
the misunderstandings, you have people going to the bathroom, which caused a big scandal. Uh, lots of very direct, frank discussions about sex as well. Um, it you know, makes a real sense of a real snapshot. It's actually fascinating, uh, rereading it again recently, how much um, their world, even though it's over 100 years ago, and you know, airplanes were just invented, <laughs> are very much like ours. There's pop music everywhere, there's advertising everywhere, stupid jingles, uh, pop culture is all over the place, people walk around, there's people are kind of doing gig economy kind of work a lot, and there's a whole lot of beer. Um, and another part of this reality is that Joyce was writing in 1922 in Zurich about Dublin in 1904. And the Dublin of 1922 and the Europe and the world of 1922 was massively different from the world of 1904. Uh, there had been a civil war in Ireland. A lot of the fighting had happened in Dublin. Uh, 1921 had been an especially grim year for uh, a lot of the stuff going on in Ireland. Um, the rest of Europe had gone through a devastating, devastating world war. Uh, Ireland was now its own country. Um, and Joyce you know, wanted to sort of recapture this world and almost reconstruct it in a photographic and wide-ranging kind of way as possible with all of the tools at his disposal that he had. He was also really rethinking this whole idea that we have in stories about um, a main hero who, who's a great character and has a big character arc. Instead, basically the book's about two people who wander around town a bunch, thinking half-completed thoughts, uh, borrowing money from friends, couch surfing, drinking a lot of beer, getting into arguments, uh, reading the newspaper while going to the bathroom, etc. Nothing's particularly resolved. You could also write just as big a book about June 17th as you could about June 16th. It would be kind of more or less the same. So that's sort of the mundane. It's very much sort of day-to-day -day kind of stuff that he talks about. But then that's the reality part. And then we have augmented. And what he did, he also goes so frequently in the opposite direction as well. Not only at the bottom is it day-to-day, -day, average, normal, mundane stuff, but on top, the narrative starts getting wackier and wackier. So he starts going through, like about halfway through the book, the narrative starts getting strange. So this is a section that takes place at a newspaper office. And every few paragraphs, there's a new headline. So it's like newspaper headlines, big, like bold. Um, oh, a great daily organist turned out. We see the canvasser at work. And it's all these headlines, like interspersed throughout. So the fact that they're in a newspaper office invades the language of the, of the thing, which is kind of wild. Um, a huge chunk of the latter part of the book is a play uh, that takes place in sort of the red light district. Um, and it's all kind of hallucinogenic, and people change all the time. And it's kind of crazy. And, um, and in fact, there's all these layers. I think about liter being like a literature nerd is kind of like being a technology nerd. Here's the 18 chapters with all the different metaphoric and mythic resonances that have been set up in each of the chapters that people have sort of figured out. Um, you know, here's where they take place, here's the time, here's the organ of the body, here's the section of the Odyssey and the creatures from the Odyssey that parallel the things that happen in the chapters and the people they meet. Here's a bunch of color schemes that tie together. Here's symbols, different arts, Literature, architecture, religion, economics, magic, uh, which kind of uh, you know, narrative technique is being, is being used. All of these things all tie together. Each chapter, which is basically a bunch of guys arguing about stuff at the pub, turns into this giant layer of myth and archetype all sort of piled on top of each other. Um, so this is the same kind of impulse that makes people memorize the history of the Dunedain from reading the Silmarillion, kind of get obsessive about this kind of stuff. Same kind of idea, same kind of nerdiness, right? Um, and you know, studying this book makes you want to do one of those crazy walls like you always see on TV. You know, they, I don't know if anybody actually does this. <laughs> I know there's software that lets you do this, but actually takes over a wall of their bedroom and like puts string everywhere. You know, but this is the kind of book that inspires that kind of thing because people will see something in one chapter just out in the corner of their eye, and they'll see uh, somebody else at the same time in another chapter, which takes place at the same time. We'll see that same thing, and it'll be all kind of cross-referenced, and it'll be kind of. Um, kind of an interesting thing. You wouldn't notice that unless you're being very careful and see how things work. And there's lots of literary allusions and all sorts of references to other things. So it gets really deep and really detailed. Um, Joyce says, I put in so many enigmas and puzzles that it'll keep the, the pro professors, that's supposed to be professors, not processors. I'm at a dead, anyway, <laughs> professors busy for centuries arguing over what I meant. And that's the only way of ensuring one's immortality. Um, <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's great, though, is I found out rereading this, because I first read this in college, right around the same time that Mosaic was just about to come out. So I missed the web wasn't really a thing yet. Um, I'm a bit older than I look. Um, and uh, because, but now reading it, I can just find any, any magical words in there, any words that I don't quite understand with some obscure, obscure reference, type it into Google. Type it into Wikipedia, bang, I've got all the details I ever needed. So it's actually a much easier book to read now than it was. You don't have to be like a 
PhD from a Jes Jesuitical college to actually understand everything. Um, it's a perfect text for the web because in many ways it is sort of a web itself. So okay, that's kind of neat. So why am I talking about this at a tech conference? Well, when I first started reading it, even back then, it kept reminding me of things I'd seen in, um, on the computer. And uh, it kept reminding me, of, actually, of video games. Uh, that may seem strange, but um, especially back, because I'm old, um, video games, you know, uh, when I was growing up, the really good ones were mostly just text, right? Things like adventure games, Zork, et cetera. And especially, I kept thinking of this game called Deadline, which is the, one of the first murder mystery adventure uh, you know, text adventure games. Um, and it's a murder mystery where things happen in the game, which is a big mansion, in the game space, at certain times. You start the game, 8 a.m. and it goes until 8 p.m. and people are moving around doing things, destroying evidence, etc. And you're just sort of moving around them. So there's actually a four-dimensional sort of space you're working in where things are happening and there's spaces and it's all done with text. Um, this is the exciting, exciting what the game looks like. Um, if you've ever played a MUD back in the day, there's text, text ones, sort of like World of Warcraft but all text. Um, same kind of idea. It's all text, and there's chapters in Ulysses that say, so-and-so did this over here, then so-and-so did this over here, so-and-so did this over here, and you're actually kind of moving through a memory space, I find, in a certain sense, like, like moving through address space in, 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 a, in a data structure. And in fact, one of the chapters, um, some uh, a local aristocrat gets in a carriage and goes through the carriage, rides through all the different episodes that are happening in the earlier part of the chapter that used to be all disconnected, and you see all the different people who are all mentioned reacting to that. So it's like going through the linked list, <laughs> sort of uh, coming through the, out the other end. Um, and so it moves through this information space. And Joyce famously said that if Dublin was destroyed in some catastrophe, it could be rebuilt brick by brick from Ulysses. Um, and I'm waiting for someday, you know, Ubisoft can, uh, once they're finished with ancient Greece and ancient, ancient Rome and Egypt uh, and France and everything, maybe they can do an Assassin's Creed Bloomsday or Assassin's <laughs> Creed Dublin where you actually fully recreate 1904 Dublin and, uh, and you can run around and, I don't know, drink beer with, with people. Um, but, you know, maybe, I'm not sure, maybe people have already started working on this. I know the tools are getting easier to work with, but it'd be kind of amazing to have a, a fully 3D virtual thing on your PlayStation. Um, so, but outside of technology, literature nerds are already working, have already been working on this kind of thing since the 50s. Uh, they're already working to recreate this world. Every year on June 16th, hundreds of people gather in Dublin and reenact the paths taken by the character. Like I said, it's actually done in real time, in real places, so you can actually go and retrace the route of uh, Leopold Bloom or Stephen Dedalus through the streets of the city. Not all the places are still there, but most of them are. Some of them are different owners, but still a lot of pubs. Um, there's a lot of drinking, because it is, uh, you know, Dublin. Um, and this celebration on June 16th is known as Bloom's Day, named after Leopold Bloom, who's one of the main characters of the book. If you've known um, the, uh, the movie The Producers, I remember one of the, the, uh, one of the characters named Leo Bloom, uh, that's because the other actors are on the still actually play Leopold Bloom in a Broadway production. So, obscure footnote there. Um, anyway, so Bloom's Day isn't just limited to Dublin, it happens all around the world. Um, I've seen it done in Toronto with a group of actors that would take people around parts of the Beaches neighborhood in Toronto and reenact little scenes from the, from, the, from, the, from the show and then there'd be some, everyone would go to a pub afterwards and of course drink lots of beer. Um, and you know, part of it is that every place can stand for Dublin and Dublin can stand for every place because James Joyce knew that secret that all good writers have that the more specific you are about something, the more universal it kind of makes it. Uh, for myself, I always write about Dublin because if I can get to the heart of Dublin, I can get to the heart of all the cities of the world. In the particular, is contained the universal. Um, and so, ever since I moved to Halifax about 10 years ago, I've been thinking a lot about when I first, first time I discovered that we have a Martello Tower, uh, the first chapter of the book takes place in this Martello Tower on the edge of Dublin, where a bunch of people are, uh, are renting an apartment, um, and one of the main characters is couch surfing there. Um, and it, you know, the whole beginning of the book takes place in this, in this tower, which is basically you know, more or less the same design as the one we have in Halifax. British Empire, late 18th century, you know, coastal defense towers, basically. Um, they're all over the place, and um, yeah, and so there's a Martello Tower in Halifax. And Halifax has a similar you know, architectural history in the sense of the British Empire and things like that. Um, obviously, somewhat different relationship in the 20th century, but uh, still, you know, here, for example, this is the general post office with a Palladian style in downtown, um, downtown Dublin, 
This is Province House in Halifax, right downtown. So you can see very similar architecture. So I kept thinking whenever walking around Halifax, boy, this could really double in for Dublin. Why doesn't it? Uh, you know, why haven't people done this before? Because goodness knows uh, we have lots of academics. We have all the universities there. We have a whole bunch of theater people. Why isn't this being done? And well, I've slowly been trying to come up with doing Bloomsday, some kind of Bloomsday thing in Halifax. And in fact, this year, I am doing Bloomsday Halifax. I'm doing Bloomsday Halifax right now, even though I'm standing right here in Fredericton. Uh, you've seen um, Lost Highway, there's that weird nightmarish guy who comes up to the main guy in a party and says, I'm in your house right now, but he's actually at a party. But he's also, he's like sort of, it's kind of this weird nightmare, it makes sense in this kind of nightmare brain. Anyway, I'm here right now, but I'm also doing Bloomsday Halifax, um, like that creepy guy from Lost Highway. So this is tied to a bigger project that I'm working on this year which is an even bigger event happening in September. And I built a whole bunch of tools uh, that this is a Bloomsday, sort of an extension of these tools. Um, and it's working with a theater company out of Halifax called Zupa Theater. Um, and they asked me, I've, worked, I've known them for ages, and they asked me to collaborate with them on this big project that's coming up called This Is Nowhere. And what is it? It's a theatrical experience. They use the smartphone technology as central to the whole experience. Um, it takes place in multiple locations all across downtown Halifax. Uh, with performances, both really intimate, like you just stand next to somebody at a bar or in the church, uh, or sometimes there's a huge, it could be huge grand things with like a choir singing and things like that. So there's going to be all these different scales of performance, all of which you are guided to and with your phone, and then that experience is enhanced by stuff that's happening on the phone as well. Each audience member's smartphone will give them hints about where the next performance is going to be happening, and when they get there, there's going to be more stuff. And a smartphone is a great technology for enhancing performance and for enhancing various kinds of artistic experience, right? Um, it's a device that almost everybody has. And it's a device that knows where it is in the world. It knows where things are in relation to itself. And it can also give directions to other things. It can provide multimedia content. Um, it can connect to a server in real time. It knows what time it is. Um, it can record, modify, and share audio and video. Um, it can overlay media on top of its view from the camera, things like that. So it's this amazing little device that everybody has that can do all this amazing magical stuff. So your phone kind of becomes the guide, the MC, <laughs> the dungeon master, the interpreter, and the program notes all at the same time. Right. So my big project this year is to allow everybody's phones to enhance their theatrical experience. Um, and this ties in with this whole thing that I've been kind of obsessed with most of my life in many ways. Ever since I was a little kid who had seen Star Wars and I was imagining Star Wars stuff all around me. I was kind of a weird hyper-imaginative kid. Um, and I've always thought about parallel virtual worlds that cohabitate with the real world, right? So one of my projects, one of my weird side things I do in Halifax is a sort of Photoshop mashups of science fiction scenery in Nova Scotia. Um, I sell t-shirts and posters and stuff every year. Anyway, there's a beautiful harbor with the Death Star. Um, and uh, I've always been that weird spaceships kid. Uh, there's the Reapers in Halifax. Um, and uh, so I've always been sort of, you know, having extra layers of meaning and reality on top of where we are has always been sort of a thing for me. Um, so Bloomsday, where we can mix Dublin and Barrington Street, didn't seem to be that far off from each other. So making and mapping 1904 and 1918, 2018 to it together sort of fits for me. Um, a lot of cultures are already kind of more on that. This is an amazing, it's kind of hard to read. Um, I don't want to kill too much time about this, but uh, this is in a Shinto shrine in Japan during the big Pokemon Go craze, you know, a few years ago, where basically they were like, try to be nice, um, uh, but please don't disturb the Pokemon while they're praying here at the Shinto shrine as well. And Pokemon is very much kind of Shinto anyway. It's little spirits that you can't actually see that have an impact in your life and you sort of go and, and uh, pay your respects to them. And so, um, and also, by the way, uh, you know, um, if you see any rare ones, do let the priests know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if you see a Pokemon inside, please don't go inside the sanctuary, even if you see Pokemon there, because that's not gonna work. Those may not be wild ones, but may actually be servants of the spirits and the gods, so be careful about that. Anyway, so, so I just find that kind of a wild thing about these invisible worlds, once again, being revealed. Pokemon Go, once again, there's a whole other universe of geolocated stuff happening that's not physically present in the world, but it's very, very real to a lot of people. Um, and this reflects back to other ideas of location and um, activity and position and things. Um, and this actually comes up in Ulysses a little bit, because this Dublin's very Catholic. 
uh, any of the Stations of the Cross, you go to places that represent different stories or different steps in a story. Uh, the Stations are the, just the 12, the 14 stages between being condemned to death and when um, Jesus is actually laid in the tomb. So the full, you know, torture and execution. Um, and a lot of churches have them stationed all the way around at the, outs the outside circuit of the church, and you can pray at each station. Um, but these steps are actually reflections of real locations in Jerusalem. Um, and people actually will go to Jerusalem and you know, recreate the actual steps of the Stations of the Cross. Now, there's a lot of controversy about exactly which route it is, and obviously the roads have changed over the years. But people dress up, and, and you know, I, like, I do like this Roman centurion with the sunglasses. Um, and this ties into ideas with mobile tech. Is also kind of a change the whole, I love this picture, the whole idea of pilgrimages. Um, let's go with a selfie stick at Mecca. Um, you know, uh, everyone's got location, they know where they're going, they know where they are, they can then record that and share that with the world. Okay, I finally, you know, made the, <laughs> made the trip to Mecca. What's actually interesting about the, the Mecca stuff is um, uh, to find out, I have a bunch of code that I had to write to make sure I could figure out, okay, from here to another point, I need to figure out what's the direction, what's, you know, which way should I be pointing the device for that. Um, and um, I was looking around, and of course, uh, there's a, their GitHub has libraries for the Qibla, which is the way to figure out where, where Mecca is, right? So it's very important, but it does this spherical trigonometry stuff that I never really remembered how to do, I uh, never really learned, I just want to put those formulas in. So I adapted them from an actual, you know, basically a religious exercise uh, GitHub li library that helps you figure out where to point when you're going to pray to Mecca. Same thing for figuring out where you need to go to find your next step in this reenactment, ritual, kind of mythic resonance kind of thing. Um, so all these things, pilgrimages, performance, ritual, art, literature, technology, all end up coming together into our mobile devices. So um, I built an app called Bloomsday, Bloomsday Halifax. This is a very kind of arch and obscure pun, which is perfectly fitting for uh, Ulysses because it's full of weird arch and obscure puns. Um, it's actually not just one app, it's a set of software elements. So there's a server side of things, that's a server side platform that supports all sorts of different kinds of clients. It's basically a JSON server, uh, it's a Rails-based thing on Heroku um, that has separate worlds you can set up with geolocations, um, and they have all sorts of flags you can set to define the type. So this, this is Nowhere project that's coming out in September, that's one piece of this. Bloomsday is another piece of this. There's other ones we're going to work on too as well. Um, and then there's different kinds of client side things. So there's a native app and there's a web based web client app. It's mostly just, um, it's a single page thing, but it's mostly just a bunch of JavaScript and some jQuery. Um, and so I've turned Bloomsday into a location based game that you use your mobile device to work with. So um, on the server side, I'll just show you a little bit of this. Um, here's one of the location profiles. There's a beach. We talk about a beach where things happen. Uh, this, is, this is our version of the beach. This is Black Rock Beach near Point Pleasant in Halifax, uh, which is doubling in for one of the doubles for Sandy Mount Strand, which is actually much bigger in Dublin. Um, and it's this area, and then I put a bunch of items in there. And so you basically can hunt for items. When you get to a location, it'll activate. It'll give you all sorts of extra narrative prompts, snippets from the book and things will scroll by so you can get some context of where you are. It'll give you some explanation of what's going on in the episode geolocated, and then it'll say there's three items nearby. And um, on just the regular web app thing, it just says, one of them is 12 meters to the northeast, the other one is, you know, 23 meters to the south, et cetera, using that Kibla direction, uh, you know, Mecca library that I found, um, with a radius, so because, you know, GPS is sometimes vague. Um, but the mobile app um, is kind of more cool, the iOS native, because I found a library called ARCL, which is augmented reality core location. And that lets you combine um, augmented reality as an overlayering things in a presence you know, on your device and the screen with actual core location, uh, which is the library that iOS uses to allow you to actually refer to things in real geographical space. And so what you can do is you can tell it, okay, this object at these GPS coordinates is represented by this image or this model. And this is this amazing thing. I was like, this is exactly what I've been obsessed with all my life. All the ways we can represent now these parallel worlds uh, visually by just opening our little phones and waving them around and we can see, oh look, we can look into this window and see in the world where these things are. Um, and it's great, this whole concept. So here's that beach, right? So this is actually this, but I'm standing right on this little bit here. Okay, there's the near one, there's two others. Um, 
Here's down, here's two locations down by the Martello Tower. I did a trial run of this on Thursday. Um, and actually a pro tip, by the way, is you're doing, um, if you're doing AR stuff, uh, if you don't have the wherewithal to do really elaborate models, um, which not all of us do, uh, or if you don't want to, you know, it takes extra processing and setup and everything. Um, and also, you can usually, the standard thing is to have a picture in there. Of course, the pictures are flat, and they're kind of cards, and they're always pointed at you. So it gives those weird things, and in somebody's face, the face sort of rotates to face you wherever you go. So one thing I found is ma massively, massively useful is just have a, um, a circle with a gradient that goes to a transparency. Uh, makes it look like a little glow, like a will of the wisp or something. And that just makes it look like a sphere, right? So it just, it actually looks really good. There's some clipping on this one because this is a rough early version, but I fixed that. Um, <laughs> but basically, just a quick, quick thing, if you're doing AR demos, uh, a quick and easy way to save you from having to do lots and lots of model work is to simply um, do a little circle with some nice, you know, uh, alpha channel fade out, and it's, um, it actually works really well. Um, they look great. Um, and the floatiness, you know, these things in AR are sort of are floaty anyway. So the fact that they're a glowing orb, uh, like some special effects movie from Steven Spielberg or something, actually makes them look, it, it makes the floatiness kind of work because it's a glowing orb in the first place. Um, but I found that ARCL does have some problems. Um, it doesn't really anchor to any, like most AR, you know, when they should point at a table, like you see some of the demos today. Uh, you point it at a table or a floor or a pattern, and it's using that as a baseline, and it's projecting those items on, the, on those baselines. Even then, sometimes it shifts a little bit. If you've ever used any AR stuff, you'll, sometimes the locking on the position is a bit tough. ARCL doesn't do any actual referencing to the physical outside world, per se. It's just using the motion sensors and the, and the other things to sort of get us, and the GPS, to get a sense of things. So every so often, as the GPS adjusts, these spheres will suddenly launch themselves 20 meters away, just as you're getting close <laughs> to them, right? Um, for some reason, earlier when I was testing, a lot, half the time, they would suddenly reset the sea level, um, <laughs> which is mostly fine. Usually, I have it say whatever the altitude is when you start, but uh, when you start looking around for them in that particular area. But Halifax is quite hilly, so sometimes, uh, you know, when you're at the beach, it's fine. But when you're up on, uh, you know, you can see already here, this is Argyle. There's, uh, I think. Prince or Duke, I can't remember, I mean, um, Sackville Street going down, it goes down like about a block, about a floor a block. Um, so that's, that can add up. And if you're trying to find something, suddenly you find yourself looking down here to see them way down, in the, you know, several hundred meters down below you. Um, so that doesn't really you know, work out. And if they're too far away, they kind of just disappear. So AR always looks cool, um, but then the effect is much less impressive when they just bounce around and disappear arbitrarily. So, it really looked really cool, but I couldn't get it to really work reliably enough to make it so that people wouldn't feel cheated when they tried to find something and it instantly like jetted away off into the distance. Um, uh, so, and it was really, you know, this is a problem is, of course, uh, with an event that's happening, it's Bloomsday, it's June 16th, it has to happen on June 16th, plus I'm driving to Fredericton and prepping this talk. So, um, you know, I had very tight time constraints, so I ended up actually not going for the full, uh, not actually launching the full on, you know, Will of the Wisp Hunter iOS app, but, um, you know, and I've also, the usual mess of getting stuff actually into the app store with certificates and test, test flight and all that was a big mess too. So um, I wasn't able to launch the full sexy version yet, unfortunately. Um, but I was able to fall back to the web app version, which is, you know, a single page app with a whole bunch of JavaScript that handles, does more or less the same things. Um, it gives you, you know, the text rolls, it uses the tab, it shows you distances and things. Um, it just doesn't give you the full AR experience, unfortunately. And that's being used right now as we speak people out there running around Halifax. So this is how I can be giving a talk here and also tour guiding a, an event in Halifax. Um, but um, it just, I, I'm trying to think of how to put this. Um, but what I like about this project is that uh, basically um, this was the first run, right? This is the first one with the software that just sort of came out. Um, next year uh, will also be June 16th, it'll be a Sunday, which hopefully will be busy. I'll have a much more fleshed out set of tools for this. Um, and so basically it becomes software that only runs once, one day a year. Um, that's only really used one day a year. And every year I can sort of soup it up to still run even better the next year. Um, so there's a musical, I think I haven't seen it, but it was, it was stuck in my brain called Brigadoon um, that is about a village in the Scottish Highlands that reappears for one day every century. Um, and it's, so it's only available on its own. You know, there's a lot of song and dance and bagpipe music and stuff. And there's a love story or whatever. Uh, but anyway, the... Um, it's a town that's only there briefly, and then it goes away again. And I like this idea of sort of very time-based software. In fact, each of the episodes in Ulysses take place at a certain time. 
And um, in the interest of keeping people from having to be up from 8 a.m. to 3 a.m. the next morning, I decided to un you know, unlock all the features all day long. But I wanted to have, or initially, you, know, you only get to see the stuff and collect the items if you're at this particular location between 10 and 11 a.m. Um, but uh, I haven't gone that far yet. Or some, some items can only be, only be collected at that. But that's stuff I'm really working on down the line. Um, and whoops, I just did the next thing there. Um, anyway, so every year it'll be a step up in features. Context. So um, that's the basics. And uh, um, if you are going to be, if you are from Halifax, you want to get down to Halifax in September. Uh, this uh, this is nowhere project is going to be really really epic and really kind of uh, unique. So if you're thinking of a trip to Halifax down down at some point in the fall, that would be something to work out for. So anyway, thank you. Um, I can open some questions and stuff like that. Um, just also, this is one of the reasons I like about Ulysses is. Um, this is a section in the very near the end of the book where the entire chapter is a bunch of questions and answers. It's like technical, a technical exam about stuff. And this is people who the main character thinks may have slept with his wife. Um, it includes <laughs> all sorts of people, including me. <laughs> um, and I read this chapter at about 2 in the morning. Um, when I, the first time I read this, it was like at school. And I read this at 2 in the morning. I was like, I have to finish the rest of this book. Ah. And I found out, and I was like, what does it mean? I read it under the hallway and I was like, yeah, all right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, anyway, so, and then I, when I wrote an essay about this, I actually signed it, Pisser. <laughs> and my prof was like, oh, I hoped you'd notice. So it was good. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's about that. So thank you very much. If you have questions, just uh, let me know. Thank you very much.